Welcome to this webinar hosted by Teradex in the IDO first steps with heterogeneous multi-core processing on the NXP i.max7. My name is Raul Munoz. I'm field application engineer at Teradex Brazil. I will present the webinar today showing the basic steps to start the development with heterogeneous multi-core system. The webinar will be the part one of two. For the second, we invite Stefano, product manager from ARM team to show the ARM DS MDK and will be much more a focus on how to advance the debug on the heterogeneous multi-core. I want to thank you everyone to join us today. A little bit about the agenda, I will quickly introduce the Colibri 7 and the multi-core heterogeneous architecture and after that I will show you how to configure the Cortex-M and using just the console and the terminal, we're going to build it and I want to, I will run it on, using U-Boot. And I will take the advantage that I will be in the U-Boot and I will show you how to, how to automatically start the Cortex-M. So after that, I will also show you how to configure the Eclipse to build and the buggy and also how to avoid some peripher peripherals conflicts. And by the end of this webinar, if, if we have time, I will show you a very quickly example how we do internal communication between the both scores. So I'm not going to teach, show you the code until the Eclipse, because I really would like to show you how, to, how we compile and do everything here. And so uh, keep calm and I will show you the, the firmware and the code when, when I import everything to the Eclipse. For those who are familiar with Toradex, we specialize in computing computing solution particular ARM-based system on module, or SONS. We have two families of SONS, Colibri and Apalis, within which the modules are pin-compatible and interchangeable. We perform a hardware and software development in-house, and generally, we guarantee 10 years product lifecycle support. We also offer free technical support directly from our developers, and sales are also handled directly by Toradex. Our product can be ordered right from our website. And finally, we have offices throughout the world allowing us to serve the needs of regional markets with a local warehouses, local sales, and technical support. Before I start the practical examples, I would like to emphasize two other things. First, first one is about our Toradex Carrier Board. We have some options to development like the Evaluation Board and the Aster Board, but we also have a couple of them we sell in volumes. So you can really use that in your production. I'm emphasizing this because new customers that do not want to create their own base board can start to test the MVP, Minimal Viable Products, using our boards and if necessary, in the future, they can create their own. Another important thing is about our carrier board is that all of them are open projects. So if you want to create your own, you, I really recommend you to check our website and find our reference designs. You can just copy our reference design and create your own. The second remark I would like to comment in our developer web is about our developer website. Like I told you before, Toradex have free engineering support. Therefore, we try to document as many technical aspects of the products as possible in order to reduce support time for the recurrent questions. During our, our history, we have generated a very good amount of docu documents and articles in our developer page. I really recommend everyone to have a look in there so just go to developer.toradex.com and we will see all our documents. All the examples I will present today can be very easily reproduced by yourself if you search for free RTOS in our developer website. Now let's talk a little bit about the computer model we are going to use today. 
The Toradex Colibri iMac 7 is based on the NXP i.Mac 7 processor. We have two versions, one single core with a Cortex A7 with 800 megahertz and another core, another version dual core with a Cortex A7 with one gigahertz each. All the models comes with RAM and flash and the Colibri iMac 7 single core comes with 256 megabytes of RAM and the dual core comes with 512 megabytes. Both versions have the named flash memory with 512 megabytes. For those unfamiliar with heterogeneous multi-core, this system on chip have the Cortex A7, like I mentioned before, and in addition, additionally, another Cortex M4 with 200 megahertz. The webinar today, I will show you how to start development for this additional core using Toradex songs with IMAX 7. And by the end of the section, you will be able to understand how to compile the bug and create a simple communication between both cores. Talking a little bit about the advantage of this architecture, the first one is, and I consider the most important one, is that the heterogeneous multi core is a harder solution for real time system. In the i.Mac 7, you will see a dual core processor composed of a Cortex A7 side by side with the Cortex M4. The basic idea is that you can really run an abstract operating system like Linux in the Cortex A and independently and in parallel. You can execute a real time OS like FreeRTOS with the Cortex M. The second consideration is about the peripherals. The Cortex M4 core lives side by side the Cortex A7, and all the peripherals like UART, I2C, SPI, GPIO, and much in others can be accessed equally by core, increasing the flexibility of choosing which peripheral we will handle by each core. Since it's a just software configuration, it allows you to decide filtering chains without change your hardware. Another important thing about the memory is about the memory. IMAX 7 Cortex M is not like a traditional microcontroller because there is no NOR flash where the firmware is storage and executed from. Sorry about the noise. In the IMAX 7 SOX case, always boots using the Cortex A7 core. The core executes the internal boot, which loads the bootloader, such as U-boot, and the bootloader will load the firmware from the mass storage, like SD card, NAND, or even for TFTP, into the memory, and trigger the Cortex M to start executing the firmware. The good point is that to upgrade or replace your firmware, you just need to replace the binary in your mass storage device. Talking a little bit about available memories, the Cortex-M can access different types of memories, different types of memory regions. So a couple of them is, is a little bit smaller and a couple of them is larger. The current slides show the region options, size, and the linker file that you can use to compile each region. And you can see, you can easily find this linkers file in the folder platform device NCI Mac 7D linker GCC. I will clone the repository after this a little bit further and you'll be able to get these files as well. Now let's talk a little bit about the environment. For the example I will show here today, I I have the development environment exactly like the slide. So I have an evaluation board with a Colibri iMac 7. This board will be connected to my computer through two different USB serial cables. One will be connected to the WART A. This will be the WART used to communicate with the Cortex A7. Basically, it's the interface we're gonna interact with the embedded Linux. The other UART, the UART-B, will be the one configured to communicate with the Cortex-M. 
Therefore, in the second terminal, you will be able to see the firmware log message, all the print files message I add to my firmware. I also have a JTAG from Seeger connected to my JTAG connector, and this will be the tool that will allow me to debug the Cortex-M. I also have an Ethernet cable that will just help me to load the TFTP binary just once, just, just for development. Now, let me explain the next step because I will start to play around the terminal and so I need to remark what I'm going to do for make me a little bit clear. So, first of all, I need to configure a tool chain. I'm not going to download here, but I will show you how you can do that. I will download the examples as well. And as well, I will not show you how how I, I'm not going to download with you, but I will show that in, I will show here exactly the command you need to do to clone out your our repository. So then I will play around and I will compile and run through the Linux terminal. After that, I will take the advantage that, that I will be playing on U-Boot and I will show you how to outrun using the U-Boot. So I will show how we can turn on the board and automatically load the firmware to the M4. Then I will add in this example into the Eclipse and configure how, how to debug the inside Eclipse. Just in that point, I will show how, what my firmware is doing and a little bit about code. It's a very simple code, but then during the bug, I will show the code. And in the end of this section, I will show another example doing moot core communication. So I'm asking my friend here to share all the links I, I have in my screen with you by the chat window. So keep your eyes open in the chat window and all the, these comments will pop up in your, in your chat. So about the tool chain, I already have mine. So we suggest you to download the Linaro 4.9 and just track it in your home. So if you are using Ubuntu or any other distro, you have to have these prayer requirements very similar like we have here in the image. So I would like to take one minute to show you our developer web page. So what, what I want to show you is we have developer page, developer.toradex.com. And if you just search for free, our thoughts. The first link we have here will be a very nice guide for you. Follow me here today. So about the tool chain, you can just come here in GNU make files and C make with GCC. And here you have the link for the tool chain and the explanation how to configure that. So also about the repository, that's my next slide. I already have it in my board. I don't want to clone it here because it will take a while. So I, you can just git clone minus b, the branch, and our URL. And then we will also have my, the same repository I have here. So let's come back here to my PPT. So here, OK. So once you clone the repository, you will be able to see these folders, docs, examples, middleware, platforms, and also our TOS. The two folders I want to emphasize is the docs. If you take a look in the docs, you will see a couple of documents and the rpmsg underscore rtos user guide is a one I really uh, suggest you to have a look if you are going to use communication between two cores. Then we have the examples. And inside the examples, we have the IMAX 7 underscore Colibri underscore M4. This will be the folder I will really play around today. So that will be the folder with uh, all the examples supported to our module. OK, cool. So let me just open here my Linux machine. So like I explained before, 
the right side, I have a terminal connected to UART B, and that will be the UART used to communicate with the Cortex M. And in the left side, I have my UART A connected to my Cortex A7, and here is where the Linux will come up. And then I have another terminal here. Just a second. This one, this is my computer. So let me go to the repository just like you, home project, Colibri IMAX 7. That's in my case, of course. And then I have Cortex M4 and new repo final. That's exactly what you have when you clone our repository. So like I told you, I have the docs. And here I have a couple of nice documents. I really recommend you to clone and take a look. And also I have the example with the platform IMAX7 underscore Colibri underscore M4. Okay, here we have a couple of files used by our module. And also we have two folders, driver example and demo apps. I'm going to use the first example is inside driver examples. And in the second one, we have demos apps. So inside demo apps, I have also our PMSG. And that will be the second example I'm going to show you. So let's go here in driver examples. And let's see what we have here. We have examples for ADC, SPI, Flexcam, GPIO, G timers, I2C, UART, and Watchdog. So I really recommend you to have a look in each example once you start development with multi-core heterogeneous. The example I'm going to compile for now is the GPIO underscore bank to IMAX 7. So we have here the main, couple of other configuration file and the ARMGC folder. Let's quickly have a look in the main. So what we have here is a very simple firmware with a main function, with hardware initialization, some print files, initialization for GPIO, and I will read a key, a push button, and according to the push button level, I will pass this value to a LED. So then I will keep my, my while true here, and once I change the GPIO status, I will update the LED, my LED. Okay, so I'm not going to show you much more about the firmware now. So let's go here in ARM GCC. And here is where I need to show you another, again, my PPT. So here we go. Every time you want to compile example, you have to export the ARM GCC underscore dir. That will make the terminal know where your tool chain is placed. So you have to export every time you close your terminal and you want to compile again using the console, the terminal. So let me let me do the, this command here, export armgcc underscore dir, dir and gcc arm no eabi and for underscore nine 2015. So Let's export it. And now let's show what we have here. Let me clean this project. And we have two script builds. We have one for build and one for clean. And we have the same make list file. This is a very important file because I will show you here. If you are not familiar with CMake, this is the file based to create that the CMake will base to create all the make files. So this is a easier way to create make files. So we have the two important points I would like to show you is all the linkers I mentioned before, you can select the linker, just changing this linker here. And you have the included directories you will use here. So once you want to add more files or more folder, you have to come here, add more paths, and recompile it again, recompile it again. And also you, the .c files and .a files must be here. 
For example, this example, I'm not using free or toss, so I don't have any include of free or toss. Once you want to use free or toss, you can you base in a project that already use free or toss, or you can just come here and include the facts needed. So let's build it, and I will show you a couple of other things. First, in white here is about the CMake to generate the make files. And in, red, in green, we have the make executed and created the debug file and now for release the same. Now let's take a look at the debug folder. So here we have another build debug script and a GPIO IMAX ELF file. That's the binary we are, we are going to load in our M4 using U-boot. But not, before, I would like to show you the build debug script. Here, we, what we have, the CMake command and the make command. So one important thing here is we are selecting the bug in that configuration. And I'm also adding Eclipse CDT4. This Eclipse CDT4 will generate also the C dot, dot C project and dot project used by Eclipse to import all the project. So let me close it and let me show you also the C project and the C dot C project and the dot project. So if you don't have this, your Eclipse will not be able to find the project. So you must come here again and generate it using the CMake. So now let's come back here to the PPT and I will explain you two things. Now we have the binary. Let me take the mark here. Now we have the, we already build all and we have the elf file. There is two ways to take this elf and execute in the U-boot. You can just use a SD card or you can use a TFTP folder. So in my case, I already have the TFTP configured. So I don't need the SD card and I will make my life easy in that point. So in the U-boot, there is two commands, one for SD card and another one for TFTP. Basically, they are the same. They just load the binary into load address and then they boot the load address. Let me do this here. Oh, sorry, let me, uh, here we go. Just a second. Here we go. Let me copy the GPIO L file to SRV TFTP and I will change the name for to m4.elf just to make my life easier in the U-boot. Now I will switch to the other two ter terminals here, one for U-boot and another one for the Cortex N. And that will be the first time I will turn all my system here. Let's do it. One, two, three. Here we go. I have the U-boot in the left side and I have the M4 quite in the right side. So let's do the command to load this file. TFTP dollar load address and M4.elf. Okay, cool. I got the I just got the binary and that's in the load address now. And if I want to run it, I just need to boot out and the same address, load address. So I will just select here for you to see the right side bringing up. So I will press enter in the cortex M, in the cortex A, sorry. And here we go, we see the Cortex, the Cortex M coming up. Let me quickly configure one thing in my terminal here. Preference, profiles. Okay, cool. So no, not that much, that's better. Okay. So you can see in the right side, the GPIO coming up and a hello messaging. And as I know, I can just push the button and we will see the LED turning on and the LED turning off. So I can 
keep doing that, and that's my M4 running my firmware. So that's a very basic example, but I just want to show you how we start the M4. And now, taking the advantage of the of I'm here in the U-boot, I will show you how I can automatically boot the M4 just after I boot my Linux. Sorry, just after I boot my U-boot and before my Linux. So let me show you this another PPT here. What you have here is, okay, we have after 2.7 beta 2, we provide a UBE volume to storage the firmware. We call it M4 firmware. So what we can do here is just UBE part, UBI part UBI. We can load the TF, using TFTP or SD card again, and we can write this binary into M4 firmware file size. So once we do that, we have the firmware in our named flash. And then after you reboot, you can just UBI read load address M4 firmware and boot the M4. So you can do that just by your hand. And you can also set this M4 boot environment and this M4 boot environment will be called every time we turn on the system. It's a read in our boot command environment. So once you set this environment, you don't need to do anything. The U boot will do everything automatically. So let's do this. And let me just a second. Come. Yeah, here we go. Let me find my command file. Yeah. Here we go. So I will restart my board here. I will do TFTP again. So let me find where I am. Yeah, here we go. TFTP again, load address M4 elf. Now I have the binary in load address. I will UBI part. And I will write this into the load address area in the M4 firmware area. Oh, yeah, here we go. UBE write M4 and file size is just in a security value to make sure you don't write more than M4 firmware have. Okay, cool. Now the firmware is in my name. So I can just reboot. I can UBI part again, UBI part, UBI, and I can read this from my name flash. So now I'm not using TFTP, I'm taking from my name, and I will also, I'm not, I will not boot that yet. Oh, sorry, let me just do it again. I will, before, before I will load that, and then I will boot out load address. Now we're going to, going to see here in the right side the boots coming up. Okay, now it's work. And now I want to, I want that every time I re, re, restart my system, this firmware starts. So I will set in exactly the same command I just did now. So I will set in M4, UBI read, and I will boot every time. Just do that and save in. So now I will select here just to you to see, and I will restart my system. And I will leave, I will leave the Linux coming up and I will see the right side, what's going on here. Here we go. My firmware is on. I can switch during the kernel. Firmware is running and Linux is coming up. Okay, cool. So let's just remove this for now because I don't want this, I don't want this M4 boot happen every time because I will debug and I will show other things here. So I will clean this environment again and we'll save it again. 
and I will restart to make sure the firmware is not working. Okay, cool. Firmware is not working. Just a second. Yeah, here we go. Now let's start talking about the Eclipse. I will import this project to the Eclipse for you to see. Just a second. Here we go. And Cortex M4 Eclipse. Let me open my Eclipse here. Okay. Once I did this webinar today, I will just remove this project from here. And this one I will delete and I will show how to import it again. So let's just, to import this project into Eclipse, you can just use right click in the project plotter, import existing project into the workspace browser, and then you have to find your project. So the mine one is in the new repo final examples, IMAX 7 Colibri driver, GPIO bank two. So then I can okay here and okay, this project here just appeared because I have the C project and the dot C project and the dot project. So you have to keep your eyes if you did everything right to have this project here automatically appearing here. Let me finish. And I will open the most important folder, target, GPIO IMAX source files, and I wanna open the main now. So, like I showed you before, I have these main instructions and a while just taking the key and pass this value to the LED. Okay, now I want to show you about a little bit about the debug, how to configure the debug using Eclipse. So I will show you. Here we go. Okay, to, for you using the Sager. JTAG, you have to you have to install this plugin from to a, this Eclipse plugin, so you can just go in help, new install new software and add this URL and select GDB Sager J Link debugging. I my friend is sharing to you all these links, so don't worry, keep your eyes open to the to the chat window and you will be able to see all the links I'm showing you today. And also you have to install JTAG tools. So if you go to this link, Seager downloads JLink, you will be able to find the JLink software and documentation package. So make sure you have this both package to the, before debugging with Eclipse. So let me, show you the debug configuration here. Once you have this plugin, you can see the J GDB Sager JLink debugging here. You can create a new one and you have something similar to this. In my case, I just select the project here. I sometimes automatically, I can see the GPIO IMAX, 7, IMAX ELF file here and in my case, I like to disable uh, auto build. I don't like every time before the buggy, I build again. I prefer to build that by myself. So switching to the second tab, the bugger, you have to find your user being JLink GDB Sager, sorry, server. This is the one you will have after install the Sager packages and tools. So once you install the previous package I just showed you, you will be able to find this GDB, JLink GDB server. And then in the device machine, you have to complete it exactly like the mine one. I just share with you in the chat, this configuration. And in my case, I, as far as I remember, I just changed the JTAG here. And uh, okay, and also I changed the other flags to that to that comments here. And I also add my Toradex IMAX 7D connected Cortex M J link script. And this script can also be, I can also, I just share with you 
using my uh, using the chat window. So if you wanna want to download this, just click in the link I share with you. Then finally, you have the GDB client setup, and you have to select also the ARM known ABI GDB from your tool chain. So in my case, it was in the ROM directory, and I just select the GDB here. Then if you switch to the second, the, the other tab, startup, as far as I remember, I it just change here to auto and I add monitor reset zero. And the other stuff, I just left exactly like I have here. And I didn't change much more, I think. But you can follow my, my configuration and just use my configuration. So, once I have it, I honestly tell you that debugger configuration from Eclipse with Sager, like this setup I did, doesn't work 100% well. So I found the way that works better if you execute the firmware before. So I will just execute any firmware here. So I just execute my M4 here, and then you can download the new app here and it will work much, much better. So let me debug here. Okay, cool. Now we have debug. And then I will show you hardware initialization. We have clock initialization, RDC initialization, and the debug wart. That's the wart two we are using today. And also I have the RDC to the GPIO bank two, just to protect the conflicts between the Cortex A7 and the Cortex M. But I will not explain too much more about here. And I will show you the log print logs message coming up in the right side here. So next step, next step, next step, next step. And here I will initialize the GPIO I will be using today. So I have here the GPIO in it for the switch one pin. And here I have the GPIO in it for this board GPIO switch one configure. And let me show you what we have here. And this is just a link for undefined for this other structure. So here is the first important point in my webinar. So just a second, I'm sorry, let me see here and go. Here we go. The main message for you about this first example is about how you use GPIO or every resource, every peripheral in our board. So in our case, we are using Toradex boards. Then we cannot change our hardware. So what I did here is I just saw my device tree and I found the last used bank used by my Cortex A, used by my Linux. What I did then, I choose the bank two and then I remove everything from the device tree and I left that exclusively to the M4. If you are doing your own care here board, I recommend you to choose the banks for the Linux and divide it a couple of banks to the M4. So don't mix banks in the Cortex M and the Cortex A7. And if you do your custom carrier board, you can easily change in your device tree to make sure you didn't have any conflicts. Then this next image show you how you how we configure any pins. I will mark some things, some stuff here. Once I decide for the GPIO bank two, and the and I will use this exclusively to the Cortex M4. I went to my Colibri data sheet and I found out the GPIO two pins and what pins is it? For example, this one is the GPIO two pin 22 and I found here what SOD is this pin about 
Then once you found the pin, for example, let's say that this SOD is coming from this external header here. Once you find it, you have to make sure you got the correct bound name here. And if you have the bound name, you can double check if the bound name is really correct and also get more information about MOOCs, for example, to use as a GPIO, it's the MOOCs 5, and also a couple of other configuration and pads and other stuff. So the most important is this name, EPDC underscore SDCA2. I'm going to show you in the next image. Let me just clear here and here we go. Now that's the exactly the struct I stopped in my software. So I have two structs. It's about the 107, 127, sorry. This bound name and GPIO 222 out MOOCs 5. So my MOOCs is here. My pad configuration is also here. And I change all the places here to the bound name I want to use. And furthermore, I have this another structure telling what pin, what direction, if it's input or output, and if it's in interrupt mode, I can change here. And to make my life easier, I define it in my board.h. And to finish, I have to initialize this pin with this structure and the configuration I want to use. Once you do that, you will be able to turn on and turn off or read your GPIO. Let me clear here, come back. And finally, I want to show you what I did to my device tree. I removed everything about GPIO 2. So I delete everything to make sure I'm using exclusively this bank 2 in the M4. And I also disable this bank 2 here. Now let's come back to the Eclipse and I will show you this. So here I have a couple of bound names. Let me switch one, for example. This is one example for the switch for the latter one. Also another bound name here is just copy and paste. And I have four options here. And to finally, I will come back here and I will initialize all my pings. And I will show you the while function here. And here we go. We see key press count zero. And once I press the suite here, turns to one and pass this value to my LED. And my LED is on and we print the value of the LED. So here we go. LED is one. And I will turn off again. And then and then okay cool so let's show you the second example and is that one is the most inter interesting example i will close this project for now i will come back to my terminal here to the, my linux machine and i'm going to the second example so the second example is in the folder demo apps and RPM. Let me see what we have in demo apps. We have hello world in different areas. We have low power example and we have sem sem semaphore examples and RPM SG examples. Let's go to RPM SG. Okay, we have here a ping pong example, bar metal, and a free air toss example. We have also a STR echo bar metal and free air toss. And we have my example is a GPIO free air toss. Here we have my files and ARM GCC. Let's go straight to the ARM GCC and let's build this and import this to Eclipse. It's easier to work inside there. So I'm going to go here in the Eclipse 
let me delete it and let me import it again so import existing project into the workspace browser demo apps rpm SG, gpio okay and then i have the project here let's finish it and open the main file it's in target folder gpio free toss source file and main so before i show you this example i have another ppt explaining oh okay i forgot about one thing just come back a little bit in the conflicts uh, as i show you we have to avoid conflicts in the bank in the gpio bank between the cortex a7 and the cortex m but we also have to avoid conflicts in every peripheral so in our case we are using the new rtb in the m4 so you have to be sure you disable the wart b by setting this uboot command or removing that from device tree. So if you are using a square C, SPI, whatever you want want to use, you have to be sure you disable from the Linux side. Now let's come back to the, the example I want to show you now. I have mm, almost the same example, the GPIO example but i add a little just a couple of functionalities to my example so i add here the message unity initialization that's a mess that message unity initialization is necessary to realize to do communication between two cars i also add a very simple task from freertos called str echo task and I also add the FreeRTOS scheduler here. And inside this functionality, I have four important functions. RPMSG init initialization, RPMSG RTOS allocate TX buffer. I have RPMSG RTOS send no copy message and receive no copy message so this is very very similar uh, socket communication or every api about communication we have so there is nothing much different so i will show you that in the code and i will try to explain during the bug okay let me come back here so let me show you i have the main example mostly like the, the preview one the preview example i have this task starting and going to this task functionality i have it exactly the same a gpio reading a gpio status and by changing the gpio status i will update the led led and once i update the led i will also send a message to the linux call it key one and the value and using the allocate tx buffer and the same send message i will send that to the linux side and finally i add another functionality that we can receive messages from the linux side and once this message have led i will see if led is led one and if it's I want to change the value to one or zero so i have a message from the linux to the m4 that can turn on or turn off my led so let's debug this let me clean and compile it again using here the eclipse here we go and i will also copy this file to pio elf to my tftp M4 elf. And now let me come back here to the okay, cool. In the U-boot, first of all, just to avoid problems, I will run my M4. Now I have the M4 example here. And I will start the bug. Here we have. Oh, I'm sorry, I just cleaned the project. Let's build it again. Here we go. 
Let me open the buggy configuration. That's exactly the same configuration we had before. And let's debug it. Okay, I stop it in the main function. And I will add a couple of breakpoints for make our life easier. So I want to see before I start the communication between cores, what's going on here in the RTOS, RPMSG initialization. And if I switch my push button, I want to see my message going out from here to the Linux. And also, if I receive any message with LED into the data, I want to stop here and check this function. So let's play. So I stop it here in the first big, in the beginning of the task. And once I press one step, I will be close here until the Linux starts the communication. So let's go to the Linux. Let's boot the Linux. Now I have kernel coming up. And after the kernel, I have my distro, my root file system. And here, to start the communication, I have to mod probe IMAX underscore RPMSG underscore TUTI. So once I press enter, I will see the debug automatically starts the to be communication. So let's press enter. Here we go. Now I, I got the communication. I will just update the switch in the LED level. And I will keep here in the while reading the GPIO. So let's just play. Let's just play here. Now, now coming back to the Linux. I need to just, okay, cool. Let me show you one thing before. We have now slash dev T2I RPMSG. This will be the device you can just open, read, and write to, re to create a communication between both cores. So I will use here in the shell, I will change this to echo mode and I will get it in the exact tree just to have the file description for the TTY RPMSG. And then I will cut I will cut this file and I will keep listen this tube. So let's switch the key here, the push button. Let's push the button and see what's going on here in the in the, the M4 side. So the key changes, the lab is now on, and I will create here my message. So my message now is key one. Can you guys see the key one? And then I will allocate that in a transfer buffer. I will copy that to my transfer buffer and I will send it. Once I send it, it's appear here for the Linux side. Okay, cool. Let's just play it again. And I will switch again, remove the breakpoint, play again, and I will keep switching. So here we go, we can see in the Linux side, the message. And if I see the microcontroller is also doing the same. That's proof that we have the microcontroller in the right side and a message inside in the Linux side. So of course, this message doesn't appear for the Linux in a real time, but it helps you to update a user interface, for example. To finish this example, I would like to show you, we can also send a message to the, from the Linux to the M4. So I will just echo LED1 equal one to the TUD, to the bus communication. And here we go, I got the message. The message is right here. And I did a very simple software to get the, this message and I will turn the LED on independently of the key. So the, now the LED's on, I will play it again. 
and I can, for example, send another message. Let's say I want to send Toradex Brazil here. Here we go. I got the message here exactly like I sent from the Linux to the M4. Okay, let me just play again here without breakpoints. Here we go. Now we have Linux and we have, I can just echo one, echo zero, and I can see my LED turning on or turning zero. And I can also keep listening and read the communication from the M4 to the Linux side. Okay, uh, let me come back here. I think that's all from my side. I would like to thank you everyone for joining me today. I'm really, really happy to be about this webinar today. That's my first webinar in English. I appreciate everyone here online and keeping with me from the beginning to now. And I will open for questions and answers. So if you have any question, we have four minutes to Keep answer your questions, so send your question to us. I will be very happy to help you. Okay, there is a, a question here about the if it's necessary to race, restart the system every time you want to reload the M4. So as far as I know, I think you need to re restart everything, but I'm not sure. I think that now, like using the G tag, I just restart the the binary to the to the first vector. So I'm not sure. I will confirm this this question and I will come back to you. So there is a question here: if it's possible to share the same bank, GPIO bank, between the Cortex A7 and the Cortex M4. So as I explained in the example, I recommend you to use exclusively each bank for each core. But I, I know that sometimes works, but if, for example, you are using interrupt, I think you're going to have a problem. So I will strongly recommend you to use exclusively bank for each course, but to really to avoid conflicts that you will not see the kernel doing in the M4 or you are doing in the Linux side. There is another question here, if we're going to share the PPT file, the slides, the images, and also uh, if it's possible to see this webinar again in our website. So I would like to show you where we have all the webinars here. Just a second, here we go. I will open the Toradex website. Here we go, Toradex. And we have here new and events and we have videos. So here you can just filter for our webinars we have. And this webinar will also be available here in the next couple of days. There is also another question about is the U-boot the same you want to use it to, to start the kernel, the Linux kernel? Yes, this is the U-boot for our IMAX 7. We implement and we got the, the implementation to boot them far from Freescale and also we did some changes. But yeah, it's our our U-boot from the same U-boot we do for Kernel we do for M4. And you also can use the file system to boot in M4, it's not a problem. There is one question about, is possible to debug the A7 exactly the same way we do for M4? So, in my opinion, doesn't make, there is two ways to debug the A7. If you wanna debug all the kernel code, you yes, you can do that using Seeger. And also, there is another way compiling from just debugging a single application. But 
If you want to debug a single application, I recommend you just use Ethernet cable and GDB. You probably will be fine and much better than using a JTAG. And also you can use all the carrier boards we have even without the JTAG connector. There is one question here about uh, logging to the flash from the M4. So, uh, as far as I know, you have to use the tube communication to send to the Linux, and then you can save it into the flash. But we have an example here. We can sleep the A7, and you can see the M4 buffering couple of information from the from from the HC, for example, and uh, but that's how that this data is in the run. So uh, you will not you will lose if you restart the system for sure. But you probably will not uh, escape from sending the message to. So there is another question here. Does the same exclusivity for M4 versus A7 recommend for GPIO apply to all peripherals like CAN or SPI? Yes, exactly. So if you use UART B, for example, in the M4, you have to avoid conflicts and stop use that in the Cortex A7. That's the same for GPIO, for GPIO Bank, for UART, SPI, I square C, all the peripherals. There is one question here about the how much data I can transfer between both cores. So I also recommend you to have a look in this page again. I have here free RTOS on our developer web page, and we have here a single part just talking about the communication. Let me find it here. Here. Changing RP MSG buffer count and buffer size. I recommend you to have a look here and probably we will answer your question about the, how many data we can transfer between both cores. Hello everyone. I, I'm so sorry, but we are out of time. We passed more than five minutes from the from the from the schedule. So I really Sorry about answer the other questions, but I will do that by email. So you can email us in our support channel here in our image. You can see all the channels. So I'm really thank you everyone to be here. And I'm sorry again about my English, my Portuguese accent, but I'm really happy everyone is here. Thank you very much.